His first post-conviction letter was mailed on March 14, 1976, although he had mistakenly dated it for February 14. Dear Anne, thanks for the letters and the commissary contribution. I've been slow in returning letters since this was the most recent setback. Probably a function of my need is to mentally rearrange my life, to prepare for the living hell of prison, to comprehend what the future holds for me. He said he was writing to me as a pump priming venture to help him begin to assess what lay ahead. He was confounded by the guilty verdict and scornful of Judge Hansen, intimating that the jurist had been influenced by public opinion rather by the evidence presented. He expected to receive a five to life sentence and felt that the Department of Adult Probation and Parole was doing its pre-sentence report with bias. The report seems to be focusing on Jackal and Hyde theory, a thing disputed by all psychologists who have examined me. Ted said he had heard that the probation investigator seemed to believe that Ted had made some damaging admission to me in the letters. Of course, he had not. I had had only those two letters from him before the trial, and with his permission, had turned them over to the King County Police Detectives. On March 22nd, Judge Hansen announced that he would delay sentencing for 90 days pending a psychological evaluation. Ted wrote to me that night as he crouched on the floor with his back against the steel wall of his cell, trying to glean enough light from the hall fixture so that he could see to write. What Ted wanted from me was my editorial advice, and for me to serve as his agent to help him sell the books he wanted to write about his case. He was anxious that we move rapidly in establishing our roles as collaborators and to agree on a percentage agreement on the distribution of the profits that would surely be forthcoming. He asked me that he keep his proposal confidential until the time was right and that I correspond with him through his attorney's office. I didn't know just what it was that he intended to write, but I responded with a long letter detailing the various avenues of publishing and explaining the correct manuscript form for submission. I also repeated again that the information about the book contract I already had with W.W. Norton on the missing girls cases and stressed my belief that his story would have to be a part of my book, just how much I couldn't know. I offered to share my profits with him, gauged by the number of chapters he might write in his own words. And I urged him to wait a bit with his attempts to publish, for his own protection. His legal entanglements in Utah and Colorado were not over. Colorado was moving rapidly in their investigation, although the public, of which I was part, knew few of the details. The discovery of the credit card purchases had leaked out, however. And I had news. I was about to take a trip to Salt Lake City as a part of the preparation for a travel log book I was editing for an Oregon publishing house. I would try to get clearance to visit him in prison. That clearance would not be easy to come by. I was not a relative, and I was not on the approved list of visitors for Theodore Robert Bundy. When I called Warren Sam Smith's office in the old prison in Draper, Utah, I was told that if I called again when I arrived in Salt Lake City, they would make a decision. I was quite certain that the answer would be no. On April 1st, 1976, I flew to Utah. I had never flown in a jet, hadn't flown at all since 1954, and the speed of the flight the knowledge that I could leave Seattle's rain and be in a comparatively balmy Salt Lake City within a few hours only added to my sense of unreality. The sun was shining, and a dusty wind blew puffs of tumbleweed over the brown landscape as I drove my rented car from the airport. I felt disoriented, much as I would three years later as I arrived in Miami, again because of Ted. I called the prison and learned that visitors were not usually allowed on days other than Sundays and Wednesdays, it was Thursday, and already 4 p.m. I talked to Warden Smith, who said, I'll have someone from the diagnostic staff call you back. The call came. What was my purpose in wanting to visit Bundy? I'm an old friend. How long would I be in Utah? Only today and tomorrow morning. How old was I? Forty. That answer seemed right. I was too old to be a Ted groupie. Okay, we're granting you a special visit. Be at the prison at 5.15. You'll have one hour. The Utah State Prison at Point of the Mountain was about 25 miles south of my hotel, and I had barely enough time to find the right freeway, going on in the right direction, and reach Drapper, the post office stop, population 700. I looked to my right and saw the Twin Towers with guards armed with shotguns. The old prison and the landscape around it seemed to be all the same gray-brown color. A feeling of hopelessness seized me. 
I could empathize with Ted's despair at being locked up. I'd spent a summer working as a student intern at the Oregon State Training School for Girls when I was 19, and I'd carried a heavy ring of flat keys wherever I went, but that was a long time before. I'd forgotten the security needed to keep human beings behind walls and bars. The guard at the door told me I couldn't take my purse inside. What can I do with it? I asked. I can't lock it in my car because my keys are in it. May I bring my keys in? Sorry, nothing inside. He finally relented and opened up a glassed-in office where I could leave my car keys after I locked my purse in my rental car. I carried my cigarettes in hand. Sorry, no cigarettes, no matches. I put them on the counter and waited for Ted to be brought down. I was feeling claustrophobia I always felt in jails, even though my work may take me into almost every jail in Washington sooner or later. I felt my chest tighten, my breath catch. To get my mind off my cloistered feelings, I glanced around the waiting room. It was, of course, empty. It was not regular visiting hours. The dull walls, sagging chairs, seemed to not have changed in fifty years. There was a candy machine, a bulletin board, pictures of the staff, a leftover religious Christmas card. To whom? For whom? Disciplinary notions on prisoners. For sale notices. An application to sign up for self-defense classes. Who? The staff? The visitors? The inmates? Where would we talk? Through a glass wall via phones? Through steel mesh? Some people hate the smell of hospitals. I hate the smell of jails and prisons. All the same, stale cigarette smoke, pine saw, urine, sweat, and dust. I didn't want to see Ted in a cage. It would be too humiliating for him. A smiling man walks towards me. Lieutenant Tanner of the prison staff and asked me to sign in, but first we moved through an electric gate that clanged shut behind us heavily. I signed my name, and Lieutenant Tanner sees me through a second electric gate. You can talk here. You'll have an hour. They'll bring Mr. Bunny down in a few minutes. It's a hallway. A tiny segment of space between two automatic gates on either side. There are two chairs shoved against a rack of hanging coats, and for some reason buckets of varnish beneath them. A guard sits in a glass enclosure four feet away. I wonder if he will be able to hear what we say. Beyond me is the prison proper, and I can hear footsteps approaching. I look away, the way one averts his eyes from someone crippled or malformed. I cannot stare at Ted in his cage. The third electric door slides open, and he is there, accompanied by two guards. They search him, pat him down. I was not searched. Had they checked me out? How did they know I had no contraband, no razor up my sleeve? Your ID, ma'am? Someone is talking to me. It's in my car. I had to leave everything in my car. The doors open again as I run back to retrieve my driver's license, something to prove who I am. I hand it to the guard and he studies it, hands it back. I have not looked directly at Ted. We both wait. And now he stands in front of me. For a crazy instant, I wonder why prisoners wear t-shirts proclaiming their religious preferences. His is orange and says agnostic on the front. I look again. No, it reads diagnostic. He is very thin, wears glasses, and his hair is cut shorter than I have ever seen it. He smells of acrid sweat as he hugs me. They leave us alone to talk in this funny coat room hall. The guard behind the glass across from us appears to be disinterested and we are interrupted only by a steady stream of people. Guards, psychologists, prisoners' wives headed for the Owl Anon meeting. One of the psychologists recognizes Ted and speaks to him, shakes hands. That's a doctor who did a psychological profile on me for John O'Connell. He told John, off the record, that he couldn't see how I could have done it. Many of the people moving past us, wearing civilian clothes, nod and speak to Ted. It is all very civilized. I'm in the fish tank. He explains. There are 40 of us in the diagnostic center. The judge ordered that I be held in a protective custody, but I turned it down. I don't want to be isolated. Still, he admits to a good deal of trepidation on his arrival at Point of the Mountain. He is aware that men convicted of crimes against women have a high mortality rate inside the walls. They were lined up to see me when I arrived. I had to walk the gauntlet. But he has found prison much easier than jail. He is rapidly becoming a jailhouse lawyer. I'll survive inside. 
if I do, because of my brain, my knowledge of the law. They seek me out for legal advice, and they're all in awe of John. I only had one really bad moment. This one guy, a killer who literally ripped out the throat of the man he killed, walked over to me, and I thought I had it. He was only interested in knowing about John and finding out how he could get John to represent him. I get along fine with all of them. He glances at the locked gate behind me. I left it open when you went for your ID. I saw the coats here, the door open, and the thought of escaping flashed through my mind. But only for a minute. The trial just finished Rankle's Ted and he wants to discuss it. He insists that Carol DeRanche was talked into her identification of him by the Salt Lake City detectives. Her original description of the man said he had dark brown eyes. Mine are blue. She couldn't make up her mind against the mustache, and she said his hair was dark, greased back. She ID'd my car from a Polaroid, and the film was overexposed, made the car look blue and it's really tan. They showed her my picture so many times, of course she recognized it. But in court, she couldn't even identify the man who picked her up and drove her to the police station. And then Jerry Thompson said he saw three pair of patent leather shoes in my closet. Why didn't he take a picture of them? Why didn't he pick them up for evidence? I never owned patent leather shoes. Somebody said I wore black patent shoes to church. Would I wear a maniac's costume to church? She never even saw the crowbar. All she said was she felt a many-sided steel or iron tool when she grasped it from behind. She said it was over her head. Ted is as scornful of the psychologist, Al Carl, who is administrating the test to him, as he is of the Utah detectives. Most of the tests are the standard ones that any psychology student is familiar with. The MMPI, Minnesota Multifacet Personality Index, consisting of hundreds of questions that can be answered yes or no, with some deliberate lie questions repeated at intervals. I spotted the lie questions when I was a freshman in college, particularly, do you ever think about things too bad to talk about? The correct answer is yes, everybody does, but many people write no. For Ted Bundy, that test was kindergarten stuff, the TAT, thematic apperception test. Look at the picture and tell a story from it. The Rorschach, or inkblot test. Ted had administrated these tests himself to patients. The Utah State Prison had its own psychological test, a series of adjectives where the subject underlines those that apply to his personality. He wants to know about my childhood, my family, my sex life, and I told him what I could. He's happy and he says, do I want to see him again? So I tell him, okay, why not? We pause as another group moves through the hallway. The next time I meet him, He's smiling. He has a diagnosis. I'm a passive aggressive personality. The man is so pleased with himself, Anne, and he sits back waiting. He expects more from me. What does he want? A full confession? I say little during our visit. He has so much to get off his chest, and with the exception of visits from Sharon Hour and occasionally from O'Connell and Bruce Lebeck, his associate, Ted feels he has no one to talk to who can communicate on his level. John thinks I should have gotten angry in court. He went to law school with Judge Hansen, and he knows the man. I was sitting there just trying to understand the motivations b behind the prosecutors, and it was, it was just too ridiculous to show emotion about. But John thinks I should have gotten mad. We talk about Sharon and Meg. He has known Sharon for more than a year and she visits him faithfully every Wednesday and Sunday. Don't mention Sharon to Meg. Sharon's jealous of Meg, and Meg doesn't really know about Sharon. I promise that I won't involve myself in his complicated romantic life, and I marvel that he can keep two intense relationships going while he's locked up with a possible life sentence hanging over him. My mother is upset with Meg for telling the King County Police that I was illegitimate. The legitimacy of Ted's birth will eventually become the least of Louis Bundy's worries. This place, they've got everything they want in here. Drugs, speed. I won't do drugs. 
I'm not going to do the usual prison trip. I'm adjusting, and I, I want to work for prison reform. I'm innocent, but I can work from the inside. Ted still wants to write, and he feels that he can get writing out to me through Sharon. Sharon regularly carries papers, legal briefs, in with her when she visits. She could carry his writing out and send it to me. I need 15000 to hire private detectives. I think Carol DeRanch or someone close to her knew the man who attacked her. I need money to hire a team of uh, independent psychologists to submit a report to the sentencing board. Everybody makes decisions about me, and I'm not even allowed to sit in on the meetings. I don't think you should try to publish anything before the 1st of June, I said. In Colorado? There's still Colorado. I talked to Colorado. They have no claim on me. What about those credit card slips in Colorado, though? He smiles. It's not against the law to be in Colorado. Sure, I was there, but a lot of people go to Colorado. I ask him if, when he writes, he will include a description of the murder cases, and he tells me that he believes those sensational cases will be essential to selling his book. Sam Shepard was found innocent after years in prison, he recalls. And his book is on an innocent man's ordeal sold. Sitting there, in that airless cubicle, I was once again on his side. He seems too frail, so beleaguered by forces over which he has no control, and yet the charisma is still there. I believe his position as a man who is, and he has been most of his life, in a situation that has no relevance to the real Ted inside. He remembers my world and politely asks how my house sale is going, how my children are. He begs me to stand by Meg, tells me how much he loves her and misses her. And then the guards are back. They tap him on the shoulder. They have given us an extra 15 minutes. He rises, hugs me again, kisses me on the cheek. They pat him down again. That's why they didn't search me. If I had given him anything, they would find it before I left. The door slides open for me, and I pause for a minute, watching him as he is led back into the belly of the prison, dwarfed by two guards. Hey, lady, g God damn it! watch out! The door is automatically closing, and I leap forward just in time to escape being caught in its metal jaws. The guard stares at me as if I'm retarded. Lieutenant Tanner thanks me politely for coming, walks me to the prison front door. And then I'm outside again past the Twin Towers, in my car, and on the road back towards Salt Lake City. The wind has kicked up a dust storm, and the prison behind me is almost obliterated from view. Suddenly, there are red lights whirling atop a van in back of me. I have become paranoid in that hour and a half at Point of the Mountain, and I wonder why they are chasing me. What did I do? The van pulls up closer and closer, and I prepare to pull over, and then it turns off on a side road, its wail fading in the wind. I realize I'm talking to myself. No. No. He couldn't have done it. He's been railroaded in there by public opinion. That man I just talked to is the same man I've always known. He has to be innocent. Driving towards the city, past the turnoffs for Midvale, for Murray, names that have never been anything before but places on a map, now the sites of the two abductions. I pass commuters, bored with their daily routine, and I'm so thankful to be free. I can go to my motel, have dinner with a friend, get on a plane and go back to Seattle. Ted can't. He is locked up with the rest of the fish. How could this happen to a young man with such a future ahead of him? I am so caught up in my reverie that I miss the turn to my motel, and wander, lost, in the wide, clean but confusing streets of Salt Lake City. It was that night, April 1st, 1976, when I had the dream. It was very frightening, jarring me awake in a strange room, in a strange city. I found myself in a large parking lot, with cars backing out and racing away. One of the cars ran over an infant, injuring it terribly, and I grabbed it up, knowing it was up to me to save it. I had to get to a hospital, but no one would help. I carried the baby, wrapped almost completely in a gray blanket, into a car rental agency. They had plenty of cars, but they looked at the baby in my arms and refused to rent me one. 
I tried to get an ambulance, but the attendants turned away. Finally, in desperation, I found a wagon, a child's wagon, and put the injured infant in it, pulling it behind me for miles until I found an emergency room. I carried the baby, running up to the desk. The admitting nurse glanced at the bundle in my arms. No, we will not treat it. But it's alive. It's going to die if you don't do something. It's better. Let it die. It will do no one any good to treat it. The nurse, the doctors, everyone turned and moved away from me and the bleeding baby. And then I looked down at it. It was not an innocent baby. It was a demon. Even as I held it, it sunk its teeth into my hand and bit me. I did not have to be a Freudian scholar to understand my dream. It was all too clear. Had I been trying to save a monster? Trying to protect something or someone who is too dangerous and evil to survive? Something deep in my unconscious mind had surfaced and told me forcefully that I perhaps believed that Ted Bundy was a killer. But I had made my commitment to keep in contact with him, no matter what the future would hold. I suspected that he did not feel things the way that I did, but I could not believe that he was not laboring under a terrible weight. I felt that perhaps I might one day be the vehicle through which he could rid himself of that weight. If he would talk to me about what had happened, could reveal the facts still hidden, it would not only help him to receive the redemption he had alluded to in his own poem, it could give some measure of relief, of finality, to the parents and relatives who still waited to learn what had happened to their daughters. Oddly, I could never picture Ted as a murderer, never visualize what had happened. It was probably best that I couldn't. When I wrote to him, my letters had to be to the man I remembered, or I couldn't do it. Once before, Ted had called me when he was in the grip of some emotional anxiety. Although he had denied making that call to me on November 20th, 1974, I had seen the phone records. He had called that night, and I sensed that there would come a day when he would need me again. Something seemed to have gone so terribly wrong with Ted's mind, and I now suspected the sick part of him was capable of murder. If that was true, then he would need someone who could listen, who would not judge, but who might help to make his confessions easier. I felt that Ted might be able to expiate his guilt through his writings, and I continued to encourage him to write. He had asked me to call Meg. In our prison visit, he had told me, I love Meg spiritually, and I wondered if that did not mean that Meg was caught up with a man who, even if he were not in prison, would never marry her. For her sake, I wrote to him, my gut reaction to discussions we have had about Meg recently, and years ago, is that you do not ultimately see your future with her as much as you love her and as much history as you share with her. There is something missing, something essential to a forever after relationship. This, of course, is not something I would discuss with her, but I will encourage any effort she puts forth to become a complete person in her own right so that she does not need any man quite as much as she needs you now. He seemed to agree, but there would be letters where he was terrified that he would lose her. Even so, there was Sharon, and I kept my promise not to discuss either woman with the other. I did call Meg, and she remembered me from that long ago Christmas party. She seemed anxious to meet me again, and we set up an appointment to have dinner together. On April 7th, Although he misdated the letter again as March 7th, 1976, I had a letter from Ted, the first since I returned from Utah. The small white envelopes furnished by the prison all had reprinted return addresses giving a post office box in Drapper, Utah, and above that, Ted wrote T.R. Bundy. Ted had pulled himself together now, an effort that would never fail to make me pause and consider the ability he had to do that. He could somehow manage to recoup and recover under such tremendous stress, and adjust to each new situation. His letter was an apology, in part, because he had usurped much of the conversation in our visit in prison. I have developed a typical prisoner's syndrome, the obsession with my legal case. The trial and the verdict live in me like some cerebral ulcer. He was writing many letters and observations in his cell, and commented that his left hand, he is left-handed, had become so strong that he broke his shoelaces without even trying. Ted commented on the link between us, a link that seemed to be growing stronger. 
You've called it karma. It may be. Yet, whatever supernatural force guides our destinies, it has brought us together in some mind-expanding situations. I must believe this invisible hand will pour more chilled Chablis for us in less treacherous, more tranquil times to come. Again, he urged me to take care of Meg for him, and he asked that I suggest to Meg that she read me some of the love poems he had sent her. He enclosed one of those poems, a poem he had printed on blue paper in the prison's printing facility. It ended, I send you this kiss, deliver this body to hold. I sleep with you tonight, with words of love untold. I would love you, if I might, with words that unfold, these arms to press you tight. When I met Meg for dinner on April 30th, 1976, she carried with her a dozen or more poems, love poems from Ted. She had typed them carefully, with copies for herself and for Ted. They were romantic sonnets, something any woman in love would have clung to. And Meg was certainly a woman in love. Yet, even as I read them, I was struck with the incongruity of the situation. This was the woman who had placed Ted in his present jeopardy. And I knew that Sharon Auer was also in love with him. Sharon, who thought Ted loved her. Meg wept as she read the poems, pointing out particularly tender phrases to me. I, I can't understand how he can forgive me after what I did to him. How he can write me poems like this. Meg slipped the poems back into the large manila envelope and glanced around the room. No one had noticed her tears. The heavyweight championship fight was on the television set above the bar, and everyone was staring at it. You know, she said softly, I, I don't make friends easily. I had um, one boyfriend and one woman friend and now I've really lost them both I I don't see Lynn anymore I I can't forgive her for making me doubt Ted I don't know when I'll ever see him again what was there Meg I asked what was there that made you go to the police was there anything besides Lynn's suspicions she shook her head I can't tell you. I know you're writing a book. I, I hope you understand, but I, I just can't talk about it. I didn't press her. I wasn't with her to try and squeeze information out of her. I was with her because Ted had asked me to stand by her. Pushing her would be too much like poking a creature with a stick. A creature already hurt. And yet Meg wanted information from me. She was jealous of Ted, even though he was locked up in the Utah State Prison. She wanted to know about Sharon. I told her, truthfully, that I really didn't know much about Sharon Hour. I didn't mention that I had talked to Sharon on the phone when I was in Salt Lake City, and that I had heard Sharon's voice turn icy when I mentioned Meg. That was my first realization that Sharon was seemingly as unsure of Ted, as possessive as Meg was. Meg struck me as terribly vulnerable, and I wondered why Ted could not let her go. She was 31, and she wanted, needed, a marriage, a chance to have the children she longed for, before there was too great a gap between them and Leanne, before Meg was too old. Ted must have known that he would not be free for years, and yet he bound her to him through his poems, letters, and calls. If anything, she loved him more than she ever had, and she was trying to cope with more guilt than she could bear. It was odd. Even as I mused about how Meg would survive with her complete dependence on Ted, I received a letter from him on May 17th, wherein he seemed terrified of losing her. He was sweating out his last two weeks before the June sentencing date, and that may have contributed to his anxiety. He seemed to feel that Meg was pulling away from him, and he asked me to go to her and plead his case. He had no real reason to doubt Meg's loyalty, but he sensed vibrations. You are the only person whom I trust, he wrote, who is both sensitive and in a position to approach Meg for me. I think it would be easier for Meg to express herself to you than to me. 
The letter ended with his opinions on the psychiatrists and psychologists who had spent three months examining him. After conducting numerous tests and extensive examinations, they have found me normal and are deeply perplexed. Both of us know that none of us is normal. Perhaps what I should say is that they find no explanation to substantiate the verdict or other allegations. No seizures, no psychosis, no disassociative reactions, no unusual habits, opinions, emotions, or fears. Controlled, intelligent, but in no way crazy. The working theory is now that I have completely forgotten everything, a theory which is disproved by their own results. Very interesting, they keep mumbling. I may have convinced one or two of them that I am innocent. I did call Meg on Ted's behalf, and found that she was completely unchanged in her devotion to him. She had managed to tell him that in a two-minute phone call to prison, and urged me to assure him that she wasn't dating anyone else. He did not want to let her go, and Meg apparently did not want to leave him. On June 5th, Meg came to my home to spend the evening. She had just seen her parents off after a week-long visit, and was tense because they were not sympathetic about her continued allegiance to Ted. She was also apprehensive about Sharon, more aware of Sharon's relationship with Ted than he realized. I was in the middle of a situation that made me uneasy. I didn't want to cover for Ted if he was deluding Meg, but I didn't want to tell her about Sharon's twice-weekly visits to the Utah State Prison either. I suspected that I was being subtly manipulated in keeping Meg bound to Ted. I wrote to him about Meg on June 6th. I think that she is aware of Sharon's relationship to you, but I stress that I really know nothing about it, and I don't know, and I don't want to know. When the time comes to think of everyday conflicts, you will have to get your act together. Ted's future was still in limbo. The sentencing on the Durant kidnapping conviction, set for June 1st, had been postponed for 30 more days. It was conceivable, but not likely, that he would receive probation, or he could receive life in prison. Psychologists were still wrestling with his personality. I had received a phone call from Al Carlisle, the psychologist in charge of the report on Ted, one Sunday evening. He began abruptly, Do you know Ted Bundy? Who wants to know? I responded, knowing Ted Bundy was becoming something that someone did not brag about. He had then identified himself, sounding like a shy, diffident man. I told him only what I had seen. There was no point in getting my dreams and fears into what was allegedly a rational, psychological study. I explained that, in all my contacts with Ted, I had found him normal, empathetic, friendly, gentle. And that was true. Well, he said, I've talked to a lot of people about him. And I've been surprised at the widely divergent opinions of him. I wanted to ask what they were, but it didn't seem the proper response. I waited. I like him myself. I've spent about 12 hours with him, and I like him. Carl wanted copies of the two Ted letters which had garnered such undeserved fame, and I said I would send them, but only with Ted's permission. Ted gave that, and I mailed them to the prison psychologist. Ted wrote again on June 9th, was sentencing just around the corner, he had geared up for a fight. The prospects are exciting. Ted found the psychological examinations malicious, slanted, and infernal. Harking back to his own psychology training, he felt prepared to deal with the questions that the doctors asked him and his friends. Questions which suggested that he might be strange, homosexual, or deviant in his demands during sexual intercourse. He was angry because his examiners had told him that some of his friends had had negative things to say about him, but would not reveal the content of interviews or the names of friends. I was aghast. Is this America? Am I to be attacked anonymously? I listed the names of several close friends, people who knew me well. None had been contacted. Who are my detractors? No response. He had received some answers. The testing team had reported to him that the nameless interviewees had indicated that he was changeable. Well, sometimes you appear happy, pleasant. Other times, 
you would seem like a different person and unresponsive, they had told him. They are trying so desperately to create a split personality, he wrote angrily. I will tear them apart. He was, indeed, looking forward to the hearing on his mental capabilities, positive that he could tear down all that the diagnosis team had constructed in the three months just past. Ted had begun to enter into the legal fight for his own freedom, and his participation would escalate over the years ahead. He was up, confident that his mind, his intelligence, could surpass whatever the psychiatric examination purported to reveal. I think he truly believed that, through his own rhetoric, he would be free. Ted did make his statements to Judge Hansen. As he made his plea, he was the cocky, witty Ted, the man so removed from the facts that the whole situation was ridiculous. It was a posture that would irritate several judges and juries in his future court wranglings, but it was seemingly an attitude necessary for the survival of his ego. I have always felt that Ted would literally rather die than be humiliated would face life in prison or the electric chair before humbling himself in any way. At the hearing, Ted was scornful as he attacked the arrest in August and October of 1975. He admitted to a certain strangeness of behavior when he had been confronted by Sergeant Bob Hayward, but could see no connection with his actions, with the contents of his car, and the Durant kidnapping. He had had no alibi for the night of November 8, 1974, and he argued, if I cannot remember precisely what occurred on a date which is now 18 and one half months prior to my arrest for a kidnapping, it is because my memory does not improve with time. It is safe to say what I was not doing, however. I was not having heart surgery, nor was I taking ballet lessons, nor was I in Mexico, nor was I abducting a complete stranger at gunpoint. There are just some things a person does not forget and just some things a person is not inclined to do under any circumstances. Then, Ted was sentenced on June 30th, despite his tearful plea that his being in prison would serve no purpose. Someday, who knows when, five or ten or more years in the future, when the time comes when I leave, I suggest you ask yourself where we are, what's been accomplished, was the sacrifice of my life worth it all? Yes, I will be a candidate for rehabilitation, but not for what I have done, but for what the system has done to me. He drew a comparatively light sentence, one to 15 years, because no other charges of such magnitude had been brought against him. He was sentenced under provisions for a lesser second degree felony. All things being equal, he could hope to be paroled as quickly as 18 months hence. But of course, all things were not equal. The investigation into the murder of Karen Campbell in Aspen, Colorado was accelerating. Investigator Mike Fisher had the credit card slips, and he had received word from the FBI lab criminalist, Bob Neal, that among the hairs found when Ted's Volkswagen was processed and vacuumed, were hairs that were microscopically alike in class and characteristic to not one, but three of Bundy's suspected victims, Karen Campbell, Melissa Smith, and Carol Durange. Hairs are not as individual as fingerprints, yet Bob Neal, an FBI crime lab expert for two decades, stated he had never found three victims' purported hairs in one spot before. The chances of three different hair samples being so microscopically alike and not belonging to the victims are 1 in 20,000. I've never seen anything like it. One Washington detective mentioned to me that the crowbar found in Ted's car matched the depression in Karen Campbell's skull. There was said to be an eyewitness, the woman who had seen the strange young man in a second floor corridor of the Wildwood Inn minutes before Karen vanished. The word among law enforcement networks was that the Colorado case was much stronger than the Utah kidnapping case had been. If Ted was aware of the burgeoning Colorado case, and I suspect he was, he was still more caught up in the emotions that lingered after the sentencing in Utah when he wrote to me on July 2, 1976. That letter was classic, and that it was the evaluation by the subject himself, an honor psychology graduate of the psychiatric evaluation done on him. The letter was typed. 
typed on an ancient machine with letters clotted with ink, but Ted's pride in his hour and a half dissection of the psychiatric evaluation transcended the blurred pages. I was whistling in the wind, yet in a curious sort of way, I felt a deep sense of fulfillment. I felt relaxed, but empathetic, controlled, but sincere, and filled with emotion. It didn't matter who was listening, although I desired each word to strike that judge as forcefully as possible. Briefly, all too briefly, I was myself again, amongst free people, using all the skill I could muster, fighting the only way I know how, with words and logic, and all too briefly, I was testing the dream of being an attorney. He knew he had lost, but he blamed that loss on the police, the prosecutors, the judge, on what he termed the weaknesses of men who are too timid, too blind, too frightened to accept the cruel deception of the state's case. The psychiatric diagnosis had concluded that Ted Bundy was not psychotic, neurotic, the victim of organic brain disease, alcoholic, addicted to drugs, suffering from a character disorder or amnesia, and was not sexual deviant. Ted quoted Dr. Austin, the psychiatrist, the one member of the team whom he had thought most forthright. I feel that Mr. Bundy is either a man who has no problems, or is smart enough and clever enough to appear close to the edge of normal. Since it has been determined by the court that he is not telling the truth regarding the present crime, I seriously question if he can be expected to tell the truth regarding any participation in any program or probation agreement. Ted's conclusion was that Judge Hansen had swayed the entire evaluation by his original verdict and that the diagnostic team had merely groomed their report to match the verdict. Carlisle had evidently concluded that Ted was a private person, one not known intimately by others. When one tries to know him, he becomes evasive. And think of me as you know me, Ted wrote. Yes, I I'm a private person, but so what? And the part about being someone incapable of being intimate is absurd. Ted had been given the California Life Goals Evaluation Scheduled Test. His answers had shown that he had six goals. To have freedom from want, to control the action of others, to guide others with their consent, to avoid boredom, to be self-fulfilled, to live one's life one's own way. None of these goals could be considered abnormal, and Ted was quick to point that out to me in his letter. He admitted readily that he was insecure, as Dr. Carlyle had suggested, and that perhaps he tried to structure his relationships with other people. Again, Think of me, our crisis clinic days, and more recently our conversations during our meetings in Seattle. It is entirely possible that I do structure my relationships with other people. Maybe not consciously, but there must be some order in my life. One of the conclusions that galled Ted the most was that Dr. Carlisle had found Ted to have a strong dependency on women and deduced that that dependency was suspect. That I am dependent on you women has got to mean something. What, though? I am undeniably dependent on women. Given birth by a woman, taught in school by women, and deeply, deeply in love with one woman. I ask any woman with whom I have been involved, socially, professionally, or intimately, to look at our relationship. Was I some twisted mass of nerves? Subjugating myself to superior womanhood? Carlyle had found that Ted had a fear of being humiliated in his relationships with women, and Ted sardonically confessed a personal distaste for being put down and humiliated. Draw whatever inferences you must, but like Br'er Rabbit, throw me in the briar patch, female companionship, anytime you want. We are still a long way from running around scooping up teenage girls. For every conclusion that Dr. Carlyle asserted, Ted had a comeback. He denied that he ran from his problems, or that he was unstable, pointing out his amazing strength under the rigors of the Durant trial, and his ability to function under stress. No one could fault him there. 
Ted continued on his incisive critique. Citing Carlyle's report, he could not agree that the profile emerging was, as the psychologist noted, consistent with the nature of the crime for which he was convicted. If this is true, Ted wrote, there are a lot of potential kidnappers running around loose out there. The conclusion is preposterous and indicative of the strenuous attempt to satisfy the presumptions underlining the verdict. The report was a despicable fraud. Ted's pain and hopelessness came through in the last paragraph of that long, long letter. I'm exhausted. The bitter reality has dawned, but the full impact of my fate has not been fully understood. Since the sentence was handed down, the first flashes of intense anger and despair have grown out of the knowledge that Meg and I shall never have a life together. The most beautiful force in my life has been separated from me. He asked me to share the letter with Meg, explaining that it was the first he had written since being sentenced and asked me to comfort her. There can never be any goodbyes for Meg and I. But I weep bitterly to think that there can be no more hellos. I was mightily impressed by Ted's ability to think like a lawyer in the polished order of his evaluation. His IQ had been tested at the Utah State Prison and found to be 124. Not an ingenious level, but what a student in a four-year college needs to graduate, but he was clearly superior to the test results. My loyalties wavered once again. It would always be so. And yet, even as I read Ted's declaration of his great love for Meg, I was aware that he seemed to be able to dismiss his concurrent relationships with other women. If he could not be faithful to Meg, how could I fully believe in his steadfast love for her? It was so hard for me to know, despite my dream, despite the bombardment of opinions from lawmen. There were still so many facets of his story that were hidden from me, and still that chance that Ted was being railroaded. If he was manipulating me, he was doing an excellent job of it.